I started China Ministries International Philippines to recruit Filipinos as missionaries to China. And, and then, how did I train them? I started with four days of training. It became three days, two days, and finally only one day. And not only one day, if they are already on the way to the airport as an OFW to China, I just give them three hours of orientation. That's enough. Now, in the Philippines, we are training, hopefully, one million Filipinos to do the same way. With three or four hours of training, on their way to the airport, you train them how to be effective missionaries for Jesus in China, or in Saudi Arabia, or in Hong Kong, or Singapore, wherever they work. And, and so I, I, I show how simple it is, but uh, to be more sophisticated, because you were talking about training pastors, we need to train pastors to see to it that they can give an ongoing program so that even if a person um, miss any of the trainings that the church provides uh, because they are absent in the Sunday school or the Bible studies or in the fellowships, uh, at least even if they go out, uh, uh, they're on their way and say, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm on my way now to go to uh, Nepal or let's say to work in, uh, in India. Uh, they will be given just a four-hour uh, class course uh, and they're off. Uh, to be an effective uh, mi missionary uh, for Jesus. Well, I, if I, I, I ended up uh, as of last year with about 110 uh, Filipinos. Uh, now, if this is uh, uh, secretly, uh, they go in as university professors, as English teachers in China. And, and, and some go and work in the factories, and etc. But very important now is God can use any believer really to be an effective priest of the Most High God wherever God places them. Their body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. They are the priests in this temple and they can bring the church, the gospel to wherever they go. And uh, without any uh, four-year training or one-year training, uh, just a few hours of reorientation of their mind that uh, you can multiply disciples uh, without uh, uh, doing too much. <laughs> In other words, you become effective by being strategic, um, by, not by working hard, by working smart. <laughs> if you know how to work smart, you know how to do the best practices of how to transform communities then also learn the best practice of how to uh, transform cultures. Uh, uh, how to disciple a Chinese to disciple his, his uh, fellow Chinese. How to uh, a Muslim, a uh, Taosub, uh, to reach out to his fellow Taosub. You got it. But anyway, uh, that's uh, the outline that I have. And since I mentioned already this a simple method, I always say that uh, I, since it is so radical, I usually have to use the Bible and use the example of Jesus. Not just the perfect God, but also the perfect man. <laughs> the perfect man who now shows us the perfect way how to disciple perfect disciples who can make disciples. <laughs> In other words, every disciple should be able to do 2 Timothy 2.2. Two. That in front of a few witnesses, you have a group of disciples who now you can tell each one whatever you have learned in front of all of these fellow witnesses. Huh? You now find faithful men, okay? find your own 12, who will be able to make disciples also, who will be able to teach others also. So this is a multiplication of at least four generations. Paul was discipled by Barnabas. He would disciple Timothy, and Timothy now would find faithful men who will be able to disciple others. So that's the kind of multiplication. And the key uh, model passage 
that I use is Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, uh, Jesus uh, sent out 72. Not just the first 12, but now the disciples of the first 12. Why? The first 12 were sent out two by two. So 12 divided by two is six. If these six pairs are disciples 12 each, how many? Exactly, 72. If these 72 went out two by two, that's 36 pairs. If they made uh, uh, 12 disciples each, how many? 432. Plus the 72 is 504. And that is also found in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. After the resurrection, Jesus at one time appeared to more than 500 brethren. Family. In other words, it's not just uh, people who are you know, uh, nominal uh, or uh, new believers, but discipled family members uh, in the family of God. And these 500, if they are to two by two, that's 250 uh, pairs. If they disciple 12 each, you know how many that they, that they can disciple? Exactly 3,000. So these 500 Galileans, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, were ready to two by two disciple 12 each from house to house. <laughs> 12 disciples who are urbanites who came from Antioch, Ephesus, uh, Alexandria, <laughs> all these major cities in the Roman Empire. And more well-traveled, more, uh, more educated than them. Uh, urbanites. And that's the kind of multiplication we'd like to see happen uh, in every barrio, <laughs> in every uh, barangay, every uh, uh, sitio, but more important, municipality, city, and, and, and in all the nations of Asia and the world. It can be done. And Jesus, uh, just, just to make it short, uh, I always just go uh, to encourage people that it can be done very simply. Uh, in verses 4 to 9, uh, there are three major characteristics uh, that should characterize the pastor or the church planter or the evangelist or anybody who wants to become a disciple maker for Jesus. Uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 4, Jesus said, don't bring your luggage or your wallet. In other words, go simply. Don't look rich. Because otherwise, the local people will start thinking of you as a Santa Claus or as a patron. Okay? Uh, who they will uh, find ways how to get, take advantage of your you know, wealth, <laughs> etc. So not, don't come in rich. Okay? Uh, just go simply. So this is good news. Uh, an ordinary OFW uh, go, goes in to go and, and uh, with hardly any money uh, in their pockets. Number, number two is you go and just look for a man of peace. Find a house, bless it, and live in that house and don't go from house to house. So very simple. Find a local person who will show you some hospitality to welcome you into the community and this person is the one you will disciple to disciple him to reach his family to reach his neighbors and to reach the leaders of his community including the buddhist monk or the uh, muslim imam the local person is the most important person in missions <laughs> so uh, an effective missionary should be able to find a local person whom you quickly make your friend and through your friendship you help uh, this person to become a follower of Jesus and out of his following of Jesus he loves God with all his gut, with all his mind, with all his soul, with all his strength and love his neighbor as himself and, and then uh, this person now will turn his community upside down not you, it's your disciple. And how your disciples multiply. And 
lastly he says wherever you go you eat or drink whatever they give you in other words take their hospitality if they give you wine drink it if they give you lechon even if you are a, a uh, if you are a, a Jew who cannot eat pork you take it right <laughs> very radical but that's the radicalness okay cross-cultural missions means becoming all things to all men and it means taking the hospitality of, of, of the lo of the local culture and secondly do it holistically uh, in the sense uh, well I entitled this do it servantly okay go servantly go as a servant and not as a master or as a boss go as a servant and of course OFWs are servants so automatically they pass the test uh, they are they go simply they go servantly the only problem is strategically <laughs> how do you make uh, but Filipinos have no problems making friends so they know how to make friends so uh, they pass also the or, already step number one of how to uh, disciple be a good friend make him your best friend and uh, as he becomes your best friend you contaminate him with your Jesus germs and uh, give him the Bible and he is on his way to uh, to follow Jesus uh, according to what the Bible says now that is the skill that is the most important because all churches in the world that are up to date know that since 2010 uh, of Lausanne Cape Town uh, 2010 all pastors have started to know that their church must be a disciple making church and uh, in the in Singapore uh, Edmund Chan uh, started to call his church disciple making church and everybody now is trying to, uh, to, to, to follow that but actually it is a secret that the Korean church already had how did Cho Yong Gi how did Han Tung Chik start mega churches all mega churches started with cell church they have wor Sunday morning worship service but that's not enough they have what we call kuyoks okay the home cell units the ho home fellowships that were happening led even by illiterate women women who cannot read and who cannot write that is in Toyongi's church they would have this uh, white veil uh, but that, that's to show that even if this person who did not finish kindergarten is a disciple maker in the church respected even by the generals and the big businessmen in the church why because every friday morning they are discipled by cho yong gi or his pastoral staff what to do in the home cell units of the church this is how did the mega churches grow in seoul in uh, Busan? very simple as the ur uh, as korea was urbanizing rural farmers r uh, rural people flooded the cities they needed fellowship they were nobodies they did not know anyone in the city they have one or two relatives there but they are lost in the big city that they came to now the churches provided through the coyotes a place where they can be cared for they can be evangelized and where they can grow in the Lord small groups why I always say disciples are only made in small groups never in big meetings and the collapse of the China, of the church now in Korea going down the decline I simply say it is only one big problem there needs revival why you have to go back to all what the revivals do revivals are always going back to small groups the Wesleyan revival was the forming of all the Wesleyan uh, converts into classes 10 males or 10 females would be uh, just discussing just one question how was your spiritual life last week did you live a holy life last week? <laughs> and then we pray for one another, you encourage one another in that small group. That's why they were called Methodists. They had this method of being in small groups. All revivals 
is always going back to the New Testament where you empower every layman, every member of the church to pray to God directly and to open the Bible and learn the Word of God directly and not spoon-fed by the pastor every Sunday with spiritual milk and not being able to get spiritual meat. To have spiritual meat, this person must be able and empowered to study the Bible for himself and within their own small groups and sharing how to learn from the Word of God by themselves. And that's why in the disciple-making movements in the world today, they call it discovery Bible study. Discovery meaning you discover God's truth for yourself and not spoon-fed to you as spiritual milk every Sunday by the pastor. So uh, that's the kind of uh, training now you can see that we need to provide uh, our pastors uh, how to do it. And so maybe uh, before I open up for the discussion, I will show you now how do we uh, partner with a Bible school, uh, ASDEX. We have only one Bible school that has started to follow the paradigm of kind of training that we have. And it is called the IRM Bible School. I am Redeemer and Master. That is actually a Methodist uh, tradition um, split from the uh, year belief uh, here in the Philippines mainly because they became charismatic and so uh, with the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, they were growing many churches uh, within uh, 10 years they had more than 500 congregations uh, all over the Philippines and they oh, but they're no longer growing as much as they should and and so uh, but their Bible school uh, president uh, Amor Ibanez uh, uh, is part of my staff and so she said maybe uh, Aztecs should help us package a curriculum uh, for our BTH program huh? uh, the bachelors of uh, Christian ministry and of bachelors in theology uh, so that uh, they can become, we can become the uh, most effective uh, denomination in the Philippines. And so uh, we worked with her in uh, packaging this new program with a radical title. The pastors are graduating now with a bachelor's in transformational leadership, major in community development. He has a secular degree, <laughs> Bachelor in Th Transformational Leadership, nothing sp uh, spiritual about it, and community development, so that they can go to the mayor or they can go to a congressman and to go to, uh, uh, to the governor or even a senator and say, can you have a budget for our community because I have, I'm an expert in developing our community uh, to become uh, the model barangay or the model city. Uh, for, for the whole country. Well, anyway, uh, what did we do with the curriculum? Well, all the traditional uh, courses that we have in most of our BTH program is there. <laughs> but they cut it uh, by about uh, five courses, okay? Uh, merged some of them because we added just 10 new courses into the curriculum of the BTH program. About uh, five or six uh, would be, I would classify under committee development, and then uh, the other four or five would be what I would call uh, cross-cultural. Uh, why? In every community, you'll find that there are people from different provinces, uh, speaking different dialects, and then there may be even Muslims in your community already. So how do you relate to the Muslims in the community? Uh, this goes back to the, uh, well, the Reformation paradigm or even the Catholic paradigm that if you're a priest or the pastor of one place, the, your parish, whether people there are Christians or non-Christians, they are your ship. <laughs> okay? uh, you think that the entire city uh, is your ship. And that you're on, in the Protestant language, we call it, you're the elder of the city. 
you, uh, so every pastor we train should become an elder of the city, at least an advisor to the mayor. If he has not, doesn't have that capacity, we have not achieved our goal. And we're even saying that in ASDEX, that if you don't have even a high school diploma, you can get our training. We offer six course <laughs> modules, four days each, to train you how to do basic community transformation. Six courses of four days each. So that's 24 days of training. How can a pastor without a high school diploma have this certificate in transformational leadership to help transform their uh, city, huh? become an elder of the city? Uh, why the skills, the character, and the uh, mentality uh, to transform communities is very basic. We also have a six, uh, mo uh, six course module, uh, six modules for one certificate program for those who want to go overseas. Kairos is one of the basic courses they have to take, but there are another uh, five courses that uh, to get this certificate to become one of our top mobilizers uh, in the Philippine missions uh, mobilization movement. Uh, why? It's very simple. Situate at your local church has a OFW ministry desk or committee that is able to situate that anyone who goes overseas from your church uh, will be able to become an expert in Disciple Multiplication Movement, DMM. Uh, that's, I think, Nono Badway uh, already has mentioned to you how, how we train uh, disciple makers. Uh, Disciple multiplication movement is what you want to see happen among the unreached. Now, back to the bachelors uh, in transformational leadership. The, uh, even at bachelors level, uh, they can already even uh, get their Kairos credited because it's one of the courses uh, in this new curriculum. They have to take Kairos uh, as a basic uh, missiology uh, course and uh, they just need to write a paper, a uh, reflection paper, uh, not a, a term paper, but just a reflection paper and pay additional <laughs> to get to make it into three units, uh, bachelor's credit uh, and, and, and etc. So, uh, so let me just say that that is the basic uh, curriculum uh, that I say is missing in most Bible schools. Okay? In our bachelor's program, we should be training pastors how to transform their community, to mobilize their church to become a light in their community. That the pastor becomes an elder of the city and his members are mobilized to obey Matthew 5.16. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We want the knowledge of the glory of God to fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. And how do we do that? By mobilizing believers to love their neighbors <laughs> effectively. <laughs> uh, and, and that's why the training is how to perfect uh, the skills in community organizing, in um, project management, in, uh, in uh, fundraising. I'm glad that's part of the course uh, some of you are taking, uh, resource development. Meaning, how do you develop your community without asking for funds? from abroad by using local resources. Just like Jesus trained the 12. You go to a community, you don't bring anything because you train your disciple, your man of peace, your person of peace, that house, how to generate funds from the community to bless not just their neighborhood, but to bless others and bring the gospel to, uh, to their other uh, communities. But that's... Uh, 
the basic principle actually in indigenous uh, principle. Huh? If you want to have an indigenous church, it has got to be self-supporting, <laughs> self-governing, uh, but more important, self-propagating. It has to self-propagate with their own resources. And, and so community development is very important. And then, hopefully, every local church in the Philippines will also have a OFW ministry desk, where the pastor has a committee in his local church ready to train anyone who wants to go overseas uh, to become an effective missionary for Jesus wherever they go to work. Uh, and the church will com commission them uh, as they uh, go forth from the church. Well, anyway, uh, that's, uh, I think, the general out overview of what? The details uh, I can give to you, uh, uh, it's all uh, in the web. And I'll give you my website uh, later on. <laughs>